Hello everyone, this is Richard from Modern Healthspan and welcome to the first in our series of interviews with Dr. Michael Lusgarden of Tufts University. In this video, Dr. Lusgarden will talk about his quantified self experiment, how he converts his blood test data to biological age and also his views on the various biological age tests. But first, let me introduce Dr. Lusgarden. Dr. Michael Lusgarten is a scientist at the Tufts University Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging in Boston, Massachusetts. His research currently focuses on the role of the gut microbiome and serum metabolome on muscle mass and function in older adults. Dr. Lusgarten is also known for his rigorous N of 1 health optimization experiments and quantified self practice with the goal of maximizing his health and lifespan and also potentially contributing to building a correlated data model for optimizing lifespan intervention for others. With that, let me start the interview. So you have a very comprehensive biohacking and kind of biotracking website where you look in, you look both at papers and at the tracking that you're doing for yourself. Um, so can you give me some kind of an intro into the, the work that you're doing and kind of the tracking that you're doing on yourself? Sure. So um, once upon a time, the uh, mantra in uh, longevity was eat real food and exercise. And I think a lot of people still have this approach, you know, as long as I'm eating a whole food uh, diet, you know, no processed foods, you know, uh, eating as we evolve to eat, uh, that they'll have a natural lifespan. Well, for me, that's not uh, precise or specific enough. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I try to think for a long time, what's a higher level than that? And for me, the higher level is uh, quantified self, self-tracking. So what should I test? So I, I track... Uh, everything in my, including uh, individual foods, how much I eat of that, and then uh, macro and ma micronutrients uh, uh, to look for more specific uh, correlations. So uh, beyond diet, I also track my fitness variables because there's evidence that uh, you know exercise extends lifespan, but it doesn't increase maximal lifespan. So how can I get the lifespan extending effects of exercise while also trying to get that pushed out so that it also increases my maximal lifespan? And then last, our, um, well, one, not last, but uh, then blood tests are also on the list. So, um, you know, using uh, various biomarkers of uh, organ and systemic health that have been studied for 50 to 100 plus years for many of the biomarkers. So it's well known how they change with age, how they change with disease risk, what's, what are levels found in youth. Uh, so I track uh, many of those uh, biomarkers too, with the idea that bio uh, uh, aging and disease is a biological process. You just don't wake up at, you know, 65, 70, 90, pick your age and have a given disease that's been going on for decades. So my hypo obviously my hypothesis there is if I track my own biochemistry, my own biomarkers for many years, I should be able to detect uh, issues as soon as they occur and to you know, uh, intervene as soon as possible to delay these aging related diseases and to push out my uh, health and lifespan uh, you know, as far as I can. And then other components too are like, you know, the microbiome, but all of those basically feed into, you know, the circulating biomarkers because your bi microbiome can be a, you know, a given, uh, you can have a given microbiome composition, but then your metabolic output of your microbiome could be different, even if your microbiome composition doesn't change. So uh, there's got to be another output beyond just looking at the microbiome, which again, goes into the circulating biomarkers. So uh, yeah, that's a pretty much, and then I should say too, I'm using simple correlations between each of these variables with my biomarkers. Uh, and I've uh, just recently, uh, I feel like I have enough data, you know, 25 plus blood tests uh, or so for each uh, biomarker to start looking at multivariate uh, uh, regression models. So in other words, instead of looking at one variable against another variable and how they correlate, you know, what are the patterns of variables in my data that explain most of the variation in a given biomarker? Uh, and so that's a more uh, rigorous and, um, detailed approach and will potentially get closer to, you know, uh, truly modifying and optimizing my biomarkers. But then I should say, you know, so going all the way back, my initial idea was eat real food and exercise. How can I do better? So I've just detailed how I think I can do better for, on that, but whether it's going to be me or it's going to be younger generations or people in this generation, whichever, someone's going to look at my approach. And part of the reason I put everything out there is so that, at, you know, people who are interested in longevity and health, can see what I'm doing, can see how far I get and say, well, you didn't do this right or that right. So I'm gonna try this. So now we've got an evolutionary experimental 
uh, experimental evolutionary approach to lifespan extension. Some people will succeed, some people will fail, and we'll figure out which approach is best, but certainly there, there may be one or a few or many people that will uh, uh, improve upon my uh, approach. And the way I see that going is using machine learning. So I'm using the simple you know, correlations and this rudimentary statistical approach, multivariate uh, you know, regression models, but someone will come in with an AI-based system and say, okay, here are your given inputs for your biomarkers. This is the diet, this is the exercise approach, this is, your, you know, uh, this is what you should do to truly optimize your system and live as long as possible. So that's the full outline of my uh, approach. Right. I, I'm sorry, given my computer science background, I'm kind of interested in, in the, the correlations and the work you're doing on that. But um, that's getting, that will get into too much detail. So uh, I think it's, that leads us to a good part to start, which would be kind of the biomarkers that you're testing. So I believe you get, you, you said you got 25s, you get tested like five or six times a year, you get all your biomarkers. Well, you, you get your blood tested um, and then you convert that so you're watching the individual man, the individual uh, things, but you also convert that into a, a biological age. So can you talk about which ones you collect and, and then um, how you convert that into a biological age? Sure. So um, uh, first, what I measure is just the standard chemistry panel, uh, complete metabolic panel, in other words, um, which includes you know uh, things like liver function, kidney function. Uh, white blood cells, red blood cells, while uh, well, that's also a part of the complete blood count, the CBC. And then I measure inflammation. So uh, before the advent of uh, the biological clock that I'm going to talk about in a second, um, I did a deep dive literature review on each of these, you know, 40 or so biomarkers on the blood test. How do they change with age? How do they change with uh, all-cause mortality or disease risk? So I wanted to know for each of them, so that I could start to figure out where they should be in terms of optimal and not necessarily what's in the reference range. Because you could be in the reference range, and you could be at the low end, and then every year it's increasing towards disease, right? Mm -hmm. And whereas, you know, it may take a few years for you to be out of range, but that process has been going on for years. So for me, I wanted to know which way should these things go, what's optimal in terms of uh, disease risk. That was before 2018 when, um, some of these biological aging clocks really start to explode, well, at least biological aging clocks in terms of the clinical uh, biomarkers, mm -hmm. as I'm talking about. The epigenetic clocks, like Horvath's initial epi epigenetic clock, I think was 2013. Um, so uh, I haven't focused on the epigenetic clocks yet because, for example, the initial Horvath clock, and I've said this a million times, apologies to anyone who's heard me say it, uh, it didn't see smoking uh, a correlation between smoking with an older epigenetic age, which to me is ridiculous. I mean, there's smoking oxidizes you, it oxidizes your lungs, it increases inflammation. It, it, you can see the skin on the faces anecdotally of people who smoke, they look older. So that it didn't see a correlation for the, you know, smoking with an older epigenetic age to me is a red flag. So I haven't focused on the initial Horvath clock for that. Um, now, so, some of the newer epigenetic clocks are much better at quantifying uh, biological age and indeed see uh, smoking to be positively correlated with an older epigenetic age. But, you know, there's 20 days of data on epigenetics in terms of uh, just, you know, in general epigenetics because the human genome was sequenced in, uh, you know, uh, 2001. So there's only 20 years of data looking at the methylation on the full genome, you know, independent of looking at one, one genes methylation or two genes, you know, I'd prefer to see what's the, the comprehensive, you know, so starting from as much methylation as possible, which machine learning approach identified the combination of methylation to identify the best uh, epigenetic age clock. All right, so besides going there, I haven't focused on the epigenetic age clock because I feel like it's still in their infancy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, and granted, there are some epigenetics clo epigenetic clocks that are very strongly correlated with chronological age, having correlation coefficients, you know, 0 0.97 or so, which a 1.0 is a perfectly linear combination. So 0 0.97 is almost as good as it gets. But as I, may, uh, as I showed in one of my recent videos, uh, you know, it's even unclear what some of these epigenetic clocks, which aspects of aging that they're even measuring. So it's still, I, I, I'd argue that there, you know, there's a lot of potential for epigenetic clocks. I, and I'll get to, you know, I'll bring it back to why uh, with my biomarkers. But, you know, I'm kind of showing why I don't focus on the epigenetics, because I feel like someone could ask me, why are you focusing on the clinical biomarkers, but not the epigenetic? So, um, 
you know, eventually that's going to be a part of my approach. Uh, but the best epigenetic clocks are currently not uh, commercially available. I think it's still Horvath, Horvath's initial clock, which looked at the, you know, again, the smoking correlation wasn't, wasn't a, a, a significant. So, um, you know, so that brings it back to these clinical biomarkers, which have been studied for 50 to 100 plus years. And what I use is um, Morgan Levine's phenotypic age calculator. Now, in two different studies, uh, the, um, the nine biomarker panel <clears throat> that their statistical approach identified, in other words, they didn't go into it saying, we're going to pick albumin, creatinine, white blood cells, et cetera, all the biomarkers that are in the biological age calculator. They let the, the, the statistics decide which would identify the best model for predicting biological age, and then use that in subsequent uh, papers to see if, if it was a, a, you know, a reliable and highly, uh, highly correlated. Mm -hmm. So in the first study, they found that their nine biomarker panel was co uh, correlated with a, a, co a correlation coefficient of 0 0.94 in a sample size of 10,000 subjects, which is pretty good. Mm -hmm. And then they looked at that, that, that nine clinical biomarker panel, that biological age calculator, uh, in NHANES-4, uh, which had 11,000 subjects, and they found a correlation of 0 0.96 with biological age. So high, very highly correlated with uh, uh, chronological age, their, their biological age calculator, to the level at uh, uh, pretty close to similar, or if not as good as, the best epigenetic clocks. So, but the, the clinical biomarkers are on, that are on Levine's, that are included in Levine's biological age calculator, at most cost about $80, which is about four times less than the epigenetic clocks. So I can test more often. There's a data that's been studied for 50 to 100 years plus, as I mentioned, uh, it's, you know, it's more affordable. Uh, so that's why I focus on Levine's phenotypic age uh, calculator. Right, so th that was age.io and age.ai. No, 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 that's a different, that's a different, that's a different uh, right. yeah, I started, I started with that, uh, but, and I'm a big fan of Alex uh, uh, Javarankov, if I'm saying his no name wrong, I apologize to Alex. Um, I started off using aging.ai, but once Levine's test came around, uh, Levine's correlations, the, the phenotypic age calculator, their correlations with chronological age are stronger than aging.ai. Aging.ai for 19 variables, not nine, right. it's a correlation of 0 0.81. So even though that's a strong correlation, I want to try to get as close to the truth as possible. So. I still record. Um, I still record my data and look at it in Aging.ai, but I don't. I ha I've moved towards publishing, you know, videos using Levine's phenotypic age calculator. Okay. So how does uh, so is is Levine's phenotypic calculator publicly available? Uh, so um, it is because I uh, somebody uh, on on a, on a age reversal forum .net, they published it and then. Uh, uh, so they published it with a link and then I uploaded that link. So I have that link too. And I double checked the stats to make sure, uh, you know, for a long time, uh, actually Levine published their, um, the formula for their biological age calculator. That's how someone was able to upload it for, to, to calculate your own for free. But, uh, Levine actually published it with a small error. Uh, you know, one of the variables was like, uh, divide by 0 0.00916 or something. And then they actually published a correction showing that they had an extra zero in there. So that uh, made your blood test results inaccurate by one to two years. So I was I was unaware of the uh, you know that error. And then somebody actually emailed me. It was like, hey, you know, they published that there's an error in it. You should update your data. So long story short is somebody posted it, the calculator. I adapted it into uh, you know my own form in with an Excel file, so I could put it on my website for anybody to uh, uh, to use. Um, and then uh, I just recently updated it in the last month or so with the, uh, you know, most accurate uh, data. So, yeah, it's, it's on my website. I can provide that uh, link to anyone who's interested. It's an Excel file. You just download it and uh, you just put the numbers into Excel and it calculates it for you automatically. And again, I double check all of the data to make sure that it was good after seeing that mistake in the uh, uh, initial publication. Okay, excellent. No, thank you. Yeah, we will share that link in the... So if you can share that with us, we will put the link right. in the description. Okay, and, and it's only nine markers. So I was going to kind of ask because uh, AGI, aging AI had so many like nineteen markers. Whether they were like key markers. So if you don't have all nine, will the clock calculate at all, or you need to have all nine? Yeah. So that's where that's where aging AI and uh, Levine's uh, phenotypic age differ. So CRP is included on Levine's phenotypic age. 
whereas uh, aging.ai, the 19 biomarkers at least, CRP is not included. So actually aging.ai would end up being a cheaper test, probably cost you less than uh, $40, you know, sometimes even less than $30, depending, depending on where, well, at least in the United States. Um, mm. uh, so yeah, it's, it, 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 aging.ai wouldn't include CRP though, but I'd argue that any test, mm -hmm. again, not to bash aging.ai because I'm a big fan and uh, they're not paying me to say that, that's my legitimate opinion. Um, yeah, it doesn't include CRP, but I think any, any biological age calculator should have some measure of inflammation. It's obviously important during aging. Right. Thank you all for watching, and I hope that you found the video informative. It is very interesting to hear from Dr. Lusgarten about his rigorous self-experimentation. On our anti-aging journey, we realize even more now that monitoring ourselves often to be able to get feedback to see if what we're doing is actually working is so important for living a better and healthier life. In the next episode, Dr. Lusgarden is going to talk about how he optimizes his biomarkers through measuring and adjusting his diet. Please stay tuned. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button for new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and will speak to you again soon.